Hi, all. Welcome. Good to see you, Benjamin and Cameron. Gene, always good to see you back. I think about those, those early Stewardship Network online sessions that we did. Good to see you there. Kevin's, Kevin's, great to see you. Judy, thanks for joining us. Kyle, great to have you. And Lizzie, always great to see you. Matt, great to see you. How are things? Mel, good to see you too. Always great to see Robert, some new folks and some returning folks. I want to encourage you all, as we're just kind of letting everybody into the room at the top of the hour here, to go ahead and drop into the chat um, where you're tuning in from. Bobby, great to see you. How are things in your world? Becky, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon for a meeting. Some strategic planning conversations. Looking forward to that. Yeah, so as I said, um, we'll we'll launch this in just another minute or so as folks are coming in. We'll let you just get settled here. Brittany, great to see you from Western New York. But go ahead and um, drop into the chat where you are tuning in from. Let us know. It's a great chance for us to be together once a month. Um, oh, Kevin from BC and Southern and Vancouver. And Cameron, great to have you here from Legacy in Chesapeake, Ohio. Oh, we're Kentucky and West Virginia join. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, so fondness for the old Southern Ohio things. Um, but go ahead and drop in. Great chance to see you, Mel and Davison, Benjamin from Leland Law State Park. One of my, actually, I would say my one of my personal favorite state parks is Leland Law State Park. So thanks for taking care of that. Um, Bobby, great to see you. Bob, as always, thanks for your behind the scene efforts. Rachel and Duluth. All right. And Petoskey, some awesome places. So go ahead and um, continue to drop in the chat. I want to just orient you to the virtual room in which you're sitting and encourage you to make liberal use of the chat and the q and I will, I will monitor both for any um, comments or questions or things that you have related to Meg's presentation. So I will go ahead and kick it off here. I want to welcome you all to the Stewardship Network's monthly webcast that happens on the second Wednesday of each and every month during the Eastern Time Zone's noon hour. Um, brought to you by the Stewardship Network, who has been doing this for the last 20-ish years. We've done hundreds of these webcasts way back before we had all this stuff, and we're doing this on a regular basis. So I want to tell you a little bit about us. We are a 501c3 nonprofit with a 20-year award-winning history, and our work is made possible by generous contributions from individuals, foundations, and corporations. So thank you all for your support. We have our geographically place-based member communities um, in the Great Lakes and in California, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So I encourage you to learn a little bit more about our place-based member communities. As I said, our webcasts happen on each and every second Wednesday of the month. Drop a recurring event into your calendar. We've got them scheduled out through next spring. Go ahead and take a look on the website. I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we're done, but uh, drop a recurring event in there and register early for the event. Our mission is to connect, equip, and mobilize people and organizations to care for land and water in their communities. So you all are very much a part of doing all of that work in your community. So thank you for the work that you do. We mobilize folks by making collaborative ecological stewardship accessible to all. We want everybody to be out in their communities, caring for land and water, and learning from each other, just like we do each and every month here um, on our monthly webcasts. We equip folks by removing hurdles and keeping you out in the field so that you can pour thousands of hours into your local ecosystems. And as I said, doing that work and learning from each other and benefiting from just the joy of being out in nature and knowing that you're making a positive difference. So really uh, appreciate the work that you all do. And we connect just by being here um, and sharing information as widely as possible. So Meg, thank you for being here today to, sh to share your work with us and one of the great ways that you can connect is at our annual conference that happens in January. After three years of COVID successful virtual being together, um, we're gonna be back in person on the 29th and 30th in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, I encourage you to go to stewardshipnetwork.org and learn a little bit more. We are really pleased to have Priya Nanjapa from the National Parks Conservation Association with us, as well as Evan Larson from the University of Wisconsin and both amazing folks in the field of environment and really looking forward to hearing from both of them. Uh, great opportunity to meet them and learn about their work. Early bird registration is open now. Encourage you all to pop in. Um, Bob's gonna drop a link to registering. You can register right now. We'll have the full agenda up you know, mid October or so, so you can learn a little bit more about that. And um, 
I encourage you all to also consider sharing your work by submitting an abstract. As I have always said, I view this conference as really our gift to our community, a chance to come together and learn from each other, share conversations in the hallway, as well as learn from those of you like Meg today, uh, uh, share your work. We wanna hear about the work that you're doing. All of you online are doing amazing work, but consider presenting and be a leader and share your work with us. Um, Abstract submission deadline is a week from this Friday, so encourage you all to consider doing that. We love learning from all of you at your by sharing your presentation. So check out the conference. Excited to be back in person with you all in January, just like I love being here with you on the monthly webcast. I'm really pleased to be here today with Meg Sanders. She's with the Wisconsin Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Uh, she's a plant pest and disease specialist and looking forward to learning more about um, the novel detection for hemlock boliadelgia that is really affecting our, our forest here. So Meg, with that, I will turn it over to you to share. And as I said to you all, continue to introduce yourself in the chat and use the Q&A. Drop in there anything that you have, any questions that you have and things that you want to share. So I encourage you to make use of that. Thanks, Meg. Thanks for having me. And if you can see my screen, is it showing as a presentation right now? Looking great. Okay, awesome. So hi everyone, I'm Meg Sanders. I'm the Forest Pest Regulatory Coordinator in Wisconsin's Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection or DATCAP in the Plant Industry Bureau. And I was invited to talk about my previous Hemlock Woolly Adelgid or HWA research that I did uh, during my master's thesis back in 2020 through 2021. I helped develop novel detection methods for HWA. So I'll start by talking about hemlock trees for just a little bit. These are riparian tree species. They're commonly found near water. They provide shade for trout streams, helping to keep that water cold. They regulate stream flow and decrease runoff into surrounding aquatic systems. Hemlocks provide many other vital services and they control ecosystem dynamics within both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Losing these trees can lead to many negative impacts to their ecosystem structure and function as some of the examples that I have listed here. Hemlock mortality in Eastern North America is largely due to the invasive insect Hemlock boliadelgid or HWA. Let's see if this will still change. Awesome. <laughs> So HWA is a tiny insect that feeds on hemlock nutrients and can kill healthy trees in as little as four years. The bottom left photo shows what a landscape looks like with a lot of hemlock die off specifically in the Appalachian Mountains. And this loss can be drastic and devastating to an ecosystem. In its invasive range here in Eastern North America, HWA cycles through two asexual generations annually. The first stage individuals right after hatching are referred to as crawlers because they're the only mobile life stage that spread to feed on hemlock needles. And once the insect settles and begins to feed on the tree, they produce a white waxy or woolly material known as an ovasac, which is shown in the bottom right photo. This covers and protects them while they feed on the tree. And humans, wind, birds, mammals, all can disperse HWA to new areas. Unfortunately, this insect has spread to many areas across Eastern North America. Sometimes I lose my clicker here. So the map on the left is data from the Forest Service showing in red all the areas of the Eastern US that HWA had invaded before 2022. Since then, it has made its way further north in Michigan with the map on the right from the Michigan DNR showing Benzie County recently added um, up, up here. <laughs> And management efforts are underway to control and stop the spread of this pest with a primary focus on early detection. Many states identify new infestations with visual assessments of hemlock trees looking for the ovisacs that I mentioned visible on the branches. These surveys can be a really large task for land managers. Um, there's not always enough time, money, or personnel to survey every tree in a forest setting. So it led to a question for me and my research uh, my advisor as well, um, looking at how can we develop an affordable early detection technique to better help land managers monitor for the invasive hemlock woolly adelgid. 
So environmental DNA or eDNA is something that's becoming much more common in monitoring for invasive species. eDNA refers to genetic material collected from the environment, whether it's soil, water, or air. Organisms shed tissues and whole cells that eventually break down and release DNA into their environment. So that can then be captured and used to monitor for the presence or absence of a specific species. And there have been successes in detecting species in terrestrial systems using eDNA for insects and even distinguishing plant communities from pollen. There have been successful applications towards detecting non-native species specifically, like the brown marmorated stink bug shown in the top right photo. Um, that was Valentin at all 2018. Spotted lanternfly in the middle photo on the right as well, Valentin at all 2020. And also um, airborne eDNA has detected fungal pathogens, the Fusarium circinatum, if I'm saying that name right, <laughs> causes pitch canker on pines. That's some symptoms shown in the bottom right photo there. That was uh, a study led by Quesada et al. 2018. So that led to a question for me, can we use eDNA to detect HWA? And we believed that we could collect airborne eDNA from a forest to detect HWA since wind has the potential to move individuals and their ovocyte material. These questions led to the overall goals of my thesis research, which ended up with two research chapters. For these purposes, I'll just refer to them as part one and part two. Part one focused on identifying an affordable, easy to use trap that's compatible with eDNA approaches and determine if it can successfully capture airborne HWA material in a forest setting, assessing that capture efficiency. Part two focused on further airborne eDNA trap assessment, as well as determining how well a rapid molecular assay works to detect HWA from environmental trap samples. And I wanted to go over both of these research projects, even though it's kind of a lot of information. But so this presentation will be a little bit more of a highlight, not getting completely in depth, depth with some parts. And part one of this research has been published, was even slightly updated from what I included in my actual thesis based on co-author and, and reviewer suggestions. We are working on publishing the research from part two. And at the end, I'll show where to find or look up those. So with part one of the research, A, part 1A, I call trap design testing. And the first goal was really a preliminary study took place in 2020 within a highly infested forest to assess different trap designs that potentially could be compatible with genetic analysis for HWA material. It included evaluating their effectiveness at capturing HWA. Prior research identified a sticky trap as an effective method to capture HWA in a forest setting. However, removal of material from the sticky glue on these traps for molecular testing can be difficult. There were a few studies, there are still few studies documenting how successful these methods would be. None were even published before I finished my research in 2021. I think all publications came after that. <laughs> um, but because of this, we wanted to develop an eDNA compatible trap that could be efficient at capturing HWA material while also still being affordable and easy to use for land managers. We decided to assess three different trap designs compared to the sticky trap. And those traps are pictured here. Moving from left to right, they are a motorized trap, a passive trap, a common Lindgren funnel trap, and then the sticky trap also shown on the right. The motorized and passive traps use four microscope slides coated in petroleum jelly attached to each trap. That material would then fall and get stuck to or otherwise kind of leave maybe genetic material on this jelly. The motorized trap slides were attached to a motor that spun the slides clockwise while the passive trap slides were attached to wind cups of a standing wind vane. We developed the motorized and passive traps with the motorized design being a modified version of a trap used in the Quesada et al. study I mentioned where they detected invasive fungal spores. And the passive trap was just something that I designed. Um, neither had been tested for capturing HWA specifically before. And previous research developed a successful protocol to extract material from petroleum jelly. So that's why we knew these could be compatible with genetic analyses. And Lindgren funnel traps are sometimes used to capture forced insects. They can be compatible with later genetic analyses of trap contents, but it was also unknown how they would fare in capturing HWA specifically. 
So I conducted, let's see if this will. Sometimes changing the slide is, <laughs> there we go. So I conducted my initial trap design testing experiment in the summer of 2020 at Pioneer Park in Muskegon County, Michigan, shown here on the map. It's a site with a known infestant of HWA. I set up a randomized block design where I had one of each trap type randomly assigned a location in each block. There were five total blocks. Um, five of each trap type were used. I collected trap samples on a weekly basis for four weeks from mid-July through mid-August in 2020. And you may wonder why such a limited amount of time. And I'll just say COVID. <laughs> we worked with what we could that year. <laughs> but I counted HWA individuals. Why do I keep losing my pointer? I counted HWA individuals caught in every trap looked at things under a dissecting microscope. And some of the photos are shown here to depict what that process looked like. The left photo shows some funnel trap contents with the red box around an HWA crawler. That's about 10 times magnification. Those individuals could blend in much easier in funnel and sticky trap contents because there's a lot of extra material caught with each sample. So this hopefully shows how tiny the HWA individuals really are. Adults are about one to two millimeters and crawlers are typically less than half a millimeter in length. So the middle photo there shows what the jelly coated microscope slides looked like up close. They had far less bycatch, which is also helpful. And the right photo shows what an HWA crawler looks like through the highest magnif magnification of the scopes that we had. Our main focus for this trap design testing was an assessment of the capture success for each non-sticky trap compared to sticky traps. So we used a Wilson score interval, which calculates an estimated success probability for each non-sticky trap based on when a corresponding sticky trap, meaning those in, within the same block and the same collection date was also successful. So if a non-sticky trap captured HWA when a corresponding sticky trap also did, the success probability would be one. But those results are shown here with the passive trap being at a 0.87, the funnel at 0.8, and the motorized at 0.4. And even though the motorized trap had a little bit lower, or much lower, I guess, like success comparatively, um, we know that there's this was a overall low sample size. Those things could, could have impacted this, a, a shorter, smaller study going on. Um, and also the number of hemlock trees varied greatly between blocks. So that's something that everything was randomly placed. Some traps happened to be placed right under or near a hemlock while others didn't. We realized that could have impacted things as well. But to consider what trap design may be best for future land manager use. We wanted to consider all things, not just the success alone. We wanted to consider ease of use, trap cost, trap sturdiness in the field, genetic analysis compatibility. And we even gave each trap a sustainability rating since some were much more reusable than others. We considered all the tested trap designs easy to use. They required about the same amount of time in the field to deploy and collect from really only five to 10 minutes, maybe even less for, for a lot of those traps. It can be pretty quick. But the lab time of counting crawlers from the funnel and sticky traps took much longer than for the motorized and passive traps also because of those much larger, much larger surface area of the sticky trap, but also just the funnel traps catching a lot of stuff as well and having to really look through everything and try to actually find crawlers. But passive traps were, while they were most successful, they were, at least compared to sticky traps, they were the least sturdy. They were, the traps and slides were broken at almost every collection for that. And continual replacement of those things would lead to increased time and effort by management teams, which we didn't think would be very beneficial. We also found that the fungal trap uh, funnel trap contents may not be as effective for DNA analysis because of the large amount of non-target bycatch. It could limit rapid DNA extraction and processing for HWA detection. That's also a potential downside to sticky traps as well. The funnel traps were the most expensive and 
although they are reusable. So just kind of thinking about all these things together, we thought that the motorized trap had potential to be the most helpful for land managers in long-term use. We had some ideas to easily make modifications to hopefully increase the capture success. So going back to the motorized trap, we had started with a 20 centimeter diameter aluminum pan covering the top of the trap. It helped protect the motor from the elements um, and allowed, unfortunately, the pan to cover the full width of the microscope slides hanging below, which probably didn't help the capture success. We also initially in the photo on the right, it shows how we had two slides facing up, but we also had two slides on their side, kind of parallel. We just thought that something motorized could maybe benefit from having slides facing the direction that it was rotating in the wind. This was just a thought based on the data with having a low trap capture success. I, I don't think it was it was necessary. Uh, the passive trap caught a lot and everything was facing upwards and had nothing covering it. So we thought, let's just update this motorized trap. Let's see what we can do. So for research part 1B, there's a second study conducted in 2021 and took place in a low infested area to identify the minimum number of traps that would be needed within a given area to maintain a high potential of still detecting an HWA infestation or capturing HWA individuals. So we evaluated how capture success, um, we evaluated the capture success with updates to the motorized trap. So we made adjustments to have all four slides facing upwards. We decreased the pan cover on the top as seen in the photo on the right here. We did a few other things. You can see that there's a different base there that I've even attached the slides to, but we just thought these things would help improve ease of use. And it really did. It makes things pretty quick. Um, but this was another way for us to evaluate what these modifications may do for trap efficiency. Another thing that we looked at was also evaluating how capture success was influenced by a trap's distance to hemlock trees and other landscape features. We looked at elevation, slope, and aspect. So the second study took place in summer of 2021 at North Ottawa Dunes in Ottawa County, Michigan. It's a property of wooded sand dunes. It borders Lake Michigan. It also had a confirmed HWA infestation and we designated it as low. Ottawa County Parks was able to provide us with their HWA survey data, which consisted of GPS locations of all hemlock trees within that park, as well as infested trees that they had identified HWA on. So this map shows our study site where we established a 90 acre circle over our survey area, sectioned it into 30 equal parts. The 30 sections or three acres each, we then divided it into five replicate groups, which is A through E. There are six sections per group, and that represents the number of traps that we set out in each of those sections. So it would either be one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to six. We had paired motorized and sticky traps set out together because we were still trying to look at that success comparison between this motorized and these sticky traps that we know are good at catching HWA. Total, there were 105 motorized, 105 sticky for this entire area. And we collected traps on every two weeks. I want to say biweekly, but I know that can just like mean different things sometimes, but it was every two weeks that we collected traps. We left them out for a total of 16 weeks from April through July of 2021, which is during both annual HWA egg hatching events. And after each biweekly collection, we counted the number of adelgids observed on each trap. Here are photos showing more views of adelgid crawlers under the dissecting scope. The sticky trap is on the right. On the left, it's one of the microscope slides with petroleum jelly and all those little red critters and a red box around one of the adelgids on the right. Those are all little adelgid crawlers. For both of the trap types, motorized and sticky, 20% of traps per collection period were also recounted for quality assurance, just as another measure to do that, because there was a lot of adelgids to count. Out of the 105 traps, motorized traps in our study, 
99 of those captured at least one adelgid over the course of the 16 week study. So most of those traps caught things, which is really good. And to compare this trap success again, we also used the Wilson, the Wilson score interval, comparing our motorized trap to the sticky trap. I put our 2021 and 2020 study results here to show those differences. So we can see in the motorized 2021 that relative success compared to sticky trap went up to 0.67. That's a lot higher than 0.4 at least, maybe not as high as some of the 0.8 that we saw in some of the traps in that initial study, but at least suggests that modifications helped. And it's promising that the motorized traps, most of them were still able to catch material and this was in a low infested area. So that's also just promising for this trap design as an option for something to use. <laughs> to evaluate the number of traps that should be deployed in a given area, we used a generalized linear mixed model to see if capture success within each three acre section was correlated with the number of traps within each section. And we did find that the specifically sections with four, five, and six traps caught significantly more than sections with one trap, which makes sense. More traps, you get more chances to catch material. But we also use a generalized linear model to evaluate the number of traps per three acre area needed to have a 0.9 probability of capturing an adelgid. So the figure here represents those results showing on the left, that's across the full 16 week trapping period. It, the dashed dotted line at the top is showing where that 0.9 probability is and where the line of adelgid captured on the trap the gray line that's sort of curving upwards, which I guess I should be able to show that with my pointer. Uh, it looks like we're hitting when you have five traps, that's when you're hitting that 0.9 probability of success over the full April to July time period where crawler numbers are varying all throughout that. Then on the right, we wanted to just look at the data when there was a peak crawler stage for us, at least in West Michigan at that time, was May 19th through June 16th. And for that time period, you only need two traps out in a three acre area to have 0.9 probability, 90% chance of, of getting successfully getting adelgids if they're present. And that also makes sense. I mean, when adelgids are more prevalent in those heavy crawler stages, there's more of them falling out of the trees, getting blown around. You have a higher chance of, of catching it on a trap. So all, all good information for us to know. We also wanted to visualize how adelgid captures change throughout our study across both annual crawler periods. So we created maps predicting HWA distribution using our count data for each motorized trap specifically. We did this using inverse distance weighted spatial interpolation or IDW. And this method predicts likely values for unsampled locations by assuming those values are related more to closer data points than they are to those that are further away. So looking at this overall figure for trapping periods, April through July of 2021, the black plus signs represent all the trap locations throughout our 90 acre study area. The square area with different colors would be the area that the IDW method is estimating number of adelgids expected to be caught by a trap based on our actual capture data. And other notable points on the map also shown on the legend are small green circles that represent hemlock tree location and purple stars that represent hemlock trees confirmed to have HWA infestations. And also, you know, Again, thanks to the Ottawa County Park staff for being able to pr provide that for us. I wanna highlight some panels more closely. So here we're looking at panels for trapping periods in late April on the left and then mid-May to early June on the right. Hopefully you can see, but the area of the light blue, this color, I think I'm in the right area. <laughs> That's where the IDW is estimating to have caught uh, that you should be able to catch anywhere from one to five adelgids sort of in that area. And then in the darker yellow, yellow areas, which you're seeing more on the 
panel on the right, that's estimating 31 to 50 adelgids in those areas. Um, the darkest blue, which there's a little bit more on the left panel, that's estimating that zero adelgids would be caught in those. And we found that at first, H, the first HWA crawler stage progressed starting in late April. We were catching increasing number of crawlers, more crawlers emerging. They start moving around. They're falling, like I mentioned before. Our traps are picking them up. But moving from the left figure to the one on the right, the colors on the panel are moving more towards those yellows and reds that are representing more, more adelgids estimated to be caught. Because in those trap areas, we did actually catch more adelgids. Adelgid numbers peaked in late May, early June, which is the time frame in the in the right panel. And this time frame of the study coincided with a peak HWA crawler stage of the year. So the interpolated values show that traps could be placed almost anywhere in the study area and have the potential to capture at least one adelgid. So really what it's showing is in that peak stage, you could have, you could put a trap almost anywhere out there and at least catch one, which for presence absent studies or for early detection, in theory, that's kind of all you need. It's not like you need to catch the most adults. You want to just be able to catch something to show you that this infestation is here, that you need to focus a little bit more on that area. The numbers did begin to decrease through June. And this is shown more in these next set of panels, specifically the left figure where most of the colored area is light blue, which is that one to five area. Um, only a few traps captured adelgids through the second crawler stage in the late summer. And our study ended on July 28th, which is what the panel on the right is showing. A lot more of that area is that darkest blue color, which is zero adelgids estimated to be caught. And we also were seeing that these maps showed a close association between the number of adelgids captured and where the infested hemlocks were located or the purple stars. So I'll go back to this peak May 19th through June 2nd sampling period. Um, this pattern is most obvious here where a lot of those yellows and reds are following at least a lot of where those purple stars are. One of the last things that we looked at was the landscape features I mentioned. We looked at trap elevation, slope, aspect, and Euclidean distance from a trap to the nearest HWA infested tree. We analyzed how these different variables impacted adelgid counts from each trap using a generalized linear model. We first ran a full model with all the variables, but slope and aspect were not significant while elevation and distance were. So we ran a reduced model with slope and aspect removed to see how that would or maybe wouldn't improve the model. Those results are here with just elevation and the Euclidean distance variables. And the model improved slightly. We were looking at the, the Akaike or AIC value uh, here for the this lower model. It's a little bit lower of a number than the full model um, AIC value. We did run an ANOVA to compare models and it wasn't significantly different. So take that for what it is, but the, with the significant variables, the, it was a little bit better. It's also important to state that there could be other variables outside of what we evaluated that could explain variation and, and ex maybe explain it a little bit better. It could be wind direction, the infestation level of each individual hemlock tree. There's other things that could be taken into account and maybe we didn't fully know what, where all the infested trees were because we did have Ottawa County's um, survey data, but that took place in fall of fall winter of 2020, and then this study took place in summer of 2021. So those are just always things to to think about and consider. Is it could have spread a little bit more? Maybe there was other trees that we didn't even know were infected. Similar to other studies that have used sticky traps to detect HWA, our study su suggests that trap distance to an infested hemlock tree does impact trap capture and number of traps can impact capture success. Our results showed that the motorized trap can catch adelgids 
almost as often as sticky traps, even in a low infestation area. I'll also add how promising I think it is uh, when you think about the surface area of the sticky traps. They're physically just much larger, able to catch a lot more material that could help with why they're able to just have a higher chance of, of catching stuff. Um, but I still think it's really awesome that something like the motorized trap or something using these small microscope slides could still have such high success in, in detecting things without having that large surface area. And there's, we could talk about it maybe at the end too, if anyone's ever curious, there's always, there's always factors as to why we, we don't, we have chosen not to try to make our microscope slides or the petroleum jelly take up the entire surface area as a sticky trap. There's, it would make lab processing not work well. <laughs> um, but I also wanna add that using traps for just examining contents to look for HWA can require taxonomic expertise to confidently identify HWA in areas where other adelgids are present. There are at least six other adelgid species common throughout the Northeast. But using a DNA compatible trap, like a motorized trap here, uh, using it in tandem with DNA analysis of the trap samples could help alleviate that issue, allow for more rapid and potentially easier confirmation of HWA presence in trap contents. So I'm going to go into research part 2A, where I did further trap assessment and kind of different trapping variations is kind of how I refer to it. So I was interested in assessing how trap height, and then again, further looking at distance to an infested hemlock stand, how that would impact trap capture success. This study started in October of 2020. So this was technically the first follow-up to that brief summer 2020 trap design testing. I chose sites with differing infestation levels to also just have a longer assessment of how well the motorized trap could capture HWA at these different infestation densities. And the map here shows each site, the Crystal River Trailhead of Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. That was our no detection site since HWA had not been found there. Pioneer Park in Muskegon used that again, high infestation area, and North Ottawa Dunes in Ottawa County used that again, our low infestation site. And six traps were stationed at each site. Two traps were centrally located within a hemlock stand. Two traps were near the edge of the stand at 150 meters from the central point. And two traps were 300 meters from the central point, continuing to move away from that stand along a transect shown in my little put together uh, animation on the right. Each set of two traps consisted of a 1.5 meter tall trap and a three meter tall trap. The photo on the left shows what our short and tall traps look like next to one another. These traps were set out for 52 weeks, so a full year. And the microscope slides were also collected every two weeks. To evaluate if trap height impacted trap success in capturing HWA, I used a Wilson score interval again, but this time comparing the short trap just to the tall trap. And looking at both sites, Pioneer and North Ottawa, just using the infested sites because they're the only ones that caught HWA, the relative success being a 0.83 and 0.94 is really showing there's not a huge difference in capture success between the height differences, which I think is interesting. I was surprised. I honestly would have thought that a taller trap would do better, but um, there's, it's just all good information uh, to have for land managers. If anyone ever thinks about looking into this again, I mean, there could always be more robust studies and more robust ways to look at this too. To assess if there was a difference in adelgid capture su success at between the traps at the different locations. I used Barnard's unconditional test. And specifically, I was comparing the zero meter location, the central to the 150, and then the zero to the 300. So um, just with the, the way that this test works, I didn't technically compare the 150 and 300s to each other. There's potentially more robust statistics that we can use to look at this as well. But we generally are getting kind of an understanding how it, how these further locations from the central hemlock stand are differing. And at Pioneer Park, there's a significant difference in trap capture between the zero and 150, but not the zero and 300. 
which I think is interesting. I would more expect, like you see at North Ottawa Dunes, how you had we had the 300 meter location trapped was significantly different from the centrally located. And that's because the further you got away from the hemlock stand, we were catching less. Whereas at Pioneer Park, for whatever reason, that 150 area uh, caught a little bit less than the three, even what the 300 caught. And the 300 didn't differ as much from that zero. So I can really only speculate there. Uh, there's, we did have some additional hemlock trees at the Pioneer Park around that 300 meter location. It was hard to always completely get away from where the hemlock trees sometimes they're a little bit scattered maybe that had something to do with it at north ottawa dunes the 300 meter location was was definitely very far away from other hemlocks it's just the way that landscape turned out there's also large dunes at north ottawa dunes <laughs> maybe some of that natural landscape feature kept adelgids from being able to move to the furthest spot too so all just really interesting things um, happening there. So the part 2B is really where I focus on molecular methods. It's uh, We wanted to determine how well a rapid molecular technique could detect HWA from in the environmental samples collected from the motorized trap. And I paired this part 2A and B together because I actually did my genetic analyses on all trap samples collected during that year-long study. So slides were collected in sterile tubes. We used latex gloves when collecting samples in the field. We made sure to sterilize hands and equipment between samples to minimize contamination. And in the lab, I was able to process collected samples by first started examining slides under the microscope again. I made note of any visible HWA individuals or other material like ovisacs. I could then scrape the petroleum jelly into its own sterile tube, which is shown in the far left photo. I There's a process that was already developed to separate jelly from the rest of the sample, which used a series of heating and centrifuging steps to help. We Well, we so you put Vaseline, this Vaseline environmental sample mixture in a tube, you add water, and then you do heating and centrifuging to bring that petroleum jelly layer to the top and then everything in theory your environmental sample based on what's been tested before it stays in that liquid form and then you can get dna from that to extract and use we used a zymo quick dna insect micro prep kit tested a lot of different things found this one worked the best for us specifically for hwa and we used a real-time polymerase chain reaction or PCR method to analyze our samples. This method specifically targeted the cytochrome oxidase 1 or CO1 gene. It's commonly used to genetically identify different animal species. It uses a primer and a probe, which are short segments of DNA that would, in theory, correspond to or pair with the target species DNA. And the technology, this cute, the real-time PCR should be able to amplify if your target species is present based on if the primer and probe is binding with DNA, where that's supposed to show that that's your target species DNA. This is what you're looking for. And researchers at Cornell were the ones that developed the primer and probe specific to HWA for using with real-time PCR. Um, both Cornell researchers and our lab tested the primer and probe specificity against six other adelgid species that can be found in the Northeast. So we did confirm that it is specific to HWA, which was great. We could use it for our methods. So we tested all our environmental samples from this experiment with the real-time PCR method. Specifically, we were looking at presence absence. And we ran samples in triplicate, each plate, it contained um, a known HWA DNA sample or a positive control. It also contained a negative control that didn't contain any sample DNA, as well as there was also a lot of other sample control, negative controls that were collected through different field and lab processes just to help track if there was any contamination at sort of these different stages that were working with samples. Um, and each sample, um, 
or I guess I should, yeah. So the samples with the figure here, we've got the, we've got a target threshold. It's calculated by the program based on control samples. So everything under this line would not be considered amplification. Thus, we would conclude that HWA is not detected. And then anything above the line, it's amplified. And it should mean that HWA DNA is present. The black squares in the lower right corner, that is our negative control. And then the red, these three pretty tightly grouped, that is our positive control. That's the DNA that we knew had HWA present. That also just helps us helps us know that the program is working <laughs> as well. Um, and then we had just have a, a series of different dots here, um, different sets of three that were real samples that had HWA detected versus all these other little, little yellow circles under here, the HWA was not detected in those samples. To determine how well the real-time PCR method could accurately detect HWA in the environmental samples, uh, we used a simple logistic regression. And so throughout the entire year of the that long-term trap study, I collected 468 total trap samples, but due to logistical constraints before I graduated in 2021, I was only able to test 108 of those environmental samples plus any negative or positive controls associated with each sample. The set of tested samples was evenly distributed among the three sites and across the collection period so that at least for my thesis, we could still have um, a good picture. But uh, the, the idea is that eventually all the samples will get tested. And that's also partially what we're waiting on publishing this research for is we really wanna get everything tested and add everything together to this paper to have a really good um, idea of, of how accurate the, this set of testing is. But uh, even just from looking at the data that I was able to run while I was there, that it indicates that adelgid counts are a good predictor for real-time PCR, detecting HWA, the, um, a significant p-value, a low AIC value there. And the figure is showing, so the number of adelgids present in each sample is on the x-axis. And, um, well, so we did, we, yeah, I'm pointing to the wrong axis, the x-axis, but we had a lot of samples that caught a lot of adelgids, which is why you're seeing these numbers jump into the thousands. Um, so that's just, it kind of makes it a little bit difficult to see this red line is supposed to be a curve, but because it's so skewed heavily with a few points being in these really heavy counts, um, on the next slide, I'll, I'll go to sort of a trimmed down version of it, but this dotted line at the top as well is supposed to be another 0.9 probability line. We're looking at adelgid counts on our slides. How many adelgids would we expect to be on a slide for this qPCR method to have a 0.9 probability of accurately detecting if that adelgid is present. So this is the trimmed down version where I only looked at data including adelgid counts up to 100 so you can see that curve a little bit better. And there's, so I guess the the, or, yeah, the horizontal line is still the 0.9 probability. The horizontal line is really showing when we're meeting that 0.9 probability, kind of bringing it down to look at that's That's roughly saying that we need 14 adelgids to have a 90% chance of being accurate at all times, I guess, with detecting with this qPCR method. Um, however, at the top, there are several data points that had some adelgids present or an ovasac or some kind of material and they were and we were still getting a positive hit it's just because there are there were still some samples that had adelgids present that didn't amplify um that kind of brings it kind of changes things a little bit but a lot of this was this was the first time that we were really streamlining a lot of these processes, whether it was extracting, uh, doing the DNA extraction process and even testing these primers and probes in real time on airborne environmental samples. 
So there's just a lot of things that maybe there was some DNA loss in some of those early processes, but things are continued. Things have been continued to improve. My advisor and her lab have continued to work on these things. I just, from what I've heard, the process is a lot more efficient. And I think once we add all the remaining trap samples, once we add that data, it's very likely that we'll kind of shift this a little bit. And I think that there's just going to be a lot less adelgids or material needed necessarily to still have that high probability of detecting the insect when it's there. It's also important to note that we didn't have any false positives. Um, we All of our negative controls were were clear and negative, which is always good to show that we didn't have contamination. If there ever was contamination on the plate, like that's not, we can't use that data. That's not, um, not real data for that. And there, there were a couple plates that did get contaminated in the early stages to the learning, the, the figuring this out. It's, it's always sad when it happens, but <laughs> um, they, any, any time that people, um, my, my advisor's lab, any time that they're spending on this, they're just further optimizing everything and the techniques and um, it can just only improve from here, which is really awesome. So part two results really suggest that infestation level and trap distance to hemlocks will have the biggest impact on trap success. Trap height may not be very important. The molecular work is the first instance of using HWA specific rapid molecular techniques to detect HWA from eDNA in Michigan as a whole. And it's also the first to target airborne eDNA specifically, because even though Cornell researchers developed the primary probe for the real-time qPCR for HWA, they were using this for real-time PCR from water eDNA samples with HWA. Um, also really good research. I recommend recommend looking that up. <laughs> but we used the real-time PCR method for presence absence. This method can potentially be used for quantitative assessment as well. Real-time PCR is often referred to as qPCR or quantitative PCR because of those capabilities. So future work could investigate incorporating qPCR methods in monitoring efforts and provide information on the level of infestation. Overall, the eDNA compatible traps could be an efficient method for land managers to detect early infestations and even low density HWA populations that can be difficult to identify visually. Everything is really centered on the sooner that management efforts can be implemented, the better chance there is at controlling or eradicating. So that's really what we care about is we just wanted to add another tool to the land manager's toolbox something that they can use in tandem with other monitoring efforts, but maybe it can save some time and money up front. Um, maybe not, maybe just setting out a trap at first. And if you get a hit, then you send out a survey crew. Just trying to, just another tool that we kind of want to add as an option. And hopefully this research can bring more implementation of molecular methods into HWA detection or other species detection for that matter. And these are links to my published paper as well as my thesis in case anyone wants to have that information. Um, I wanted to highlight some other ongoing HWA research, so feel free to kind of jot any of this stuff down. But I just wanted to say that in Dr. Partridge's lab at Grand Valley State, um, in the Annis Water Resources Institute specifically, her lab has continued assessing airborne eDNA trap efficiency. They further updated the trap design to be more like the passive trap from that initial 2020 test that did really well. The design upgrade is shown in this image here where one of the undergrads in Dr. Partridge's lab, um, Kate Geller, she designed this, this 3D printable trap. It's really great. I've heard awesome things about it and it's in just helping with its efficiency. There's nothing covering up those slides anymore. Um, I'm assuming that that capture success is gonna go up there. And I also just wanted to highlight that Dr. Partridge's lab has been looking at DNA, eDNA degradation rates on these slides. She has a new grad student, Keely Dunham, working to evaluate HWA impacts on native biodiversity of Michigan's hardwood forests. So keep your eyes and ears open for continued research coming out of that lab and just other awesome research because the Partridge lab has a wider ecology and genomics focus. 
And with that, I just want to acknowledge a um, huge thanks to my funding sources for this research. It was the U.S. Forest Service, Grand Valley State, the Anis Water Resources Institute funded my research assistantship. Um, GV I got GVSU's presidential research grant to help with some of those um, costs. Of course, thanks to my advisor, Dr. Charlotte Partridge. My committee members were Dr. Allie Locker and Dr. Jim McNair, also at GVSU. Um, I have a lot of names listed, a lot of photos to kind of like just both ways um, acknowledge and thank everyone that helped out with this research because it was a lot. It was a long effort, two years. And huge thanks to my current department with the Wisconsin Department of uh, Agriculture for supporting me and giving this presentation today. And huge thanks to the Stewardship Network for bringing me on and having me. So with that, I will take questions. Yeah, Meg, thank you so much. And congrats on the research, right? Like what a huge, <laughs> what a huge undertaking and effort. I can imagine, you know, going out and collecting those slides every two weeks. And like you said, there's some degradation, but still um, really successful. Yeah. Hey, so time for just a, just a question or two. So one question was um, whether or not you did any wind speed um, data collection when you were when you were doing those um, zero, 150 and 300 meter um, traps. Was there any additional data that you had on that? We didn't. There yeah. were there were a lot of logistical constraints is kind of what it mostly comes down to and some of the funding for it. But it's definitely always been a hot topic that has been something that I think people should look at and continue to think about wind, whether it's wind direction or the wind speed and looking at that and, and how that movement is going to vary. Because there's really limited, there's limited studies on that in general with even previous sticky trap studies that have been done. So it's definitely something that I think is worth looking into. Yeah, great. Well, we'll keep an eye out for um, additional research on that. And and I want to just take a, as Kevin says, thank you. Very interesting talk and really appreciate it. And just um, a final thought for you before we turn to some kind of closing slides. What recommendations would you have for a land manager that's got hemlocks and, you know, maybe not currently not infested? What, what would be your recommendation for that land manager in terms Recom of traps? Monitoring. You know, yeah, monitoring exactly and using traps and okay. would you yeah, yep. Yeah, I mean, based on based on what we've seen and also just sort of anecdotal stuff that my advisor, since they've made the trap modifications and some of that work, I know a little bit about what's been going on there and how efficient that can be. Really we're seeing that in in the prime summer, like crawler stages, you really only need a couple traps. If you've got infestation, based on what we know, those traps should catch something. So as far as if you're looking for, I kind of view it as an easy, maybe passive way of just stick some traps out, maybe check on them every couple of weeks, um, even just kind of preemptively. I know my advisor with some of the eDNA degradation stuff, they have found that the DNA is still upholding even after a month of That's stuff cool. being out. So I mean, there's yeah. just really cool stuff where it's like just passively put something out there. Um, check on it every now and then see if you've got anything showing up on the slides or send it to a lab for someone else who can do that. Check on that for you. I just think if you have an infestation, the traps in theory should catch something during those crawler months. But the the data is still out onto how well we can detect it in other months because that was also part of what we were trying to look at with that year long study and just not having all that data processed yet. That's another question that we were interested in is how can we actually still detect it even outside of summer? But yeah, um, just, yeah, I don't know. That's, I hope that answers it. It's that, yeah, that does. And I think, and I think I appreciate, you know, the fact that we could be talking about this for a whole another couple hours too. So really appreciate your presentation. Thank you all online. I want to um, just remind you again that the Stewardship Network Conference is coming up and the end of January 29th and 30th at, um, at the Kellogg Center in East Lansing. There, Bob is reminding you that you can submit your abstract and um, wanna encourage you to sign up for these webcasts. As I said, second Wednesday of each and every month during the Eastern time zones noon hour. Um, we have these scheduled out through the spring of next year. I wanna encourage you to sign up early for them and then we'll send you a reminder email just like we did today. Again, uh, on that lower right-hand side, you'll see in October, we're talking about old growth forests and a network of 
of those old growth forests um, in Michigan. We're talking about pipe and plovers in, in November with um, Jillian Farkas of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In December, we're looking at radical ecosystem change, applying resist accept direct framework from the USGS. And so really looking forward to seeing you at upcoming um, Stewardship Network monthly webcasts. And I just want to thank you for your time. Meg, thank you so much for sharing what you did. Um, really appreciate it and look forward to further research out of GVSU and um, the work that you're doing in Wisconsin. And then for you all online, share your share what you're doing. How are you monitoring HWA and um, are you using any traps and those kinds of things? So we'll look forward to staying in dialogue with you all um, over the coming months. So again, thank you all so much. Really appreciate your time being here with us on the Stewardship Network Monthly Webcast.